The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good evening, First Robotics Canada community. My name is Sean Lim, and I'm the Director of District Implementation for the province of Ontario. And welcome back for another installment of Ask the Experts. And we are now on to week six of competition, where we have just completed both the North Bay and McMaster District events. And we, of course, have also finalized all the district point rankings and have an idea now of which teams will be attending the district championships and uh, those who unfortunately may have missed the cut. But we have two panelists joining us this evening. Uh, first of all, we have Parsuthar, who is the scouting lead from FRC Team 188, the Blizzard out of Wolverine Collegiate in Scarborough, Ontario. Uh, Parth, how are you doing this evening? Hi, Ms. Hi, Mr. Lev. I'm great. Great to be here. Well, great to have you, especially since uh, you have just competed in one of these Week 6 events, namely the McMaster event, and uh, we're actually directly involved in probably some of the more interesting uh, matches, which we'll get to later on. And of course, for our, our second guest, this one's going to be a little interesting for our audience members, because both of our panelists do have the first name Parth, but we have Mr. Parth Patel, uh, the Derive Coach from FRC Team 610, and that would be Crescent Robotics out of Toronto, Ontario. Uh, Parth Patel, how are you doing this evening? Uh, very well, thank you. Happy to be here. I'm excited for the Ontario Provincial Championships. Awesome, and uh, you know, with both teams being participants in it, both 188 and 610, um, I think you guys will have some pretty good perspective since you've probably done your scouting uh, on the other teams who are going to be out there. So we're excited to have both of you on board. <clears throat> but let's kick things off very quickly and take a quick look at the landscape regarding our district points here in Ontario. And now that we've had a chance to play six weeks worth of district events, we have now finalized the points, <coughs> excuse me, but we have not yet finalized who exactly will be attending because here in Ontario, uh, the teams basically have another day to commit or decline their offer or their invitation to attend the district championships. But here in Ontario, we're basically looking at the top 60, 60 point getting teams uh, receiving an invitation to the district championships. Um, and, and Chairman's Award winners will be attending as well. Uh, and there will be EI winners and Rookie All-Star winners who will be attending, not with the robots, but who will be attending uh, as team only to be able to compete for those awards. Uh, and I know this uh, sounds confusing, but unless they have also qualified based on points, in which case they'll, they will be able to bring their robots. But I wanted to swing over to our panelists uh, initially to maybe get some thoughts from them regarding the the rankings and maybe some surprises or maybe there's no surprises in terms of what the rankings look like. But uh, looking at our top 60, uh, I'd be curious to know. Let's start this off with uh, with Parsuthar. Um, what are your thoughts on the rankings? Were, were all the teams that you expected to be there, did they make it? Are there some unexpected ones? Uh, and in fact, are there some surprises even in terms of who didn't qualify for the district championships? Parth Suthar, why don't you kick us off? Hey, so I really think that this list has most of the teams that are what we what we were expecting, but some of the some of the good some of the veteran teams that have been performing in the past years that have not made it would be teams like thirteen ten who are who were just close to the uh, list, they're I think at 65, 68, uh, ranked number 68, and uh, there are other teams like 1334 and 2013 who have been performing pretty. They've been at a good. They've been a good robot at every other year. I don't know. I don't. I'm not really sure of what happened there, but they. I'll be missing them at this week champs as well. Uh, other than that, some of the interesting ones I would like to note would be some of the rookies that I've been seeing at some of these events, um, namely 6378 Team Lynx, who are higher up at number 11. They did perform really nicely at uh, both of their events, actually, and I was at both of the events, so it was it was great watching them. 
uh, likewise with uh, team 6481 and 6387 disco bots and uh, I, I I'm sorry if I pronounce this wrong, but I think it's Deuce X Machina. And they've been performing pretty nicely as well. Um, it's just great to see these rookies uh, show up at, at this level of competition in their first year. Yeah, I have to agree with that, where I think at all the events that I've been to, um, everyone who's been involved with the FRC community has basically said that, you know, there have been just rookies who have been performing and performing at a high level and when we look at 6378 you know this is not a fluke these guys have most definitely earned their spot you know for the number 11th rank in the province and uh, when you see who they're surrounded by at that number 11th ranking like that's some pretty impressive company uh the Jabberwockies, who are in the 14th position that's that's a team that i had a chance to see uh at two events at both i'm pretty sure it was durham Week one, uh, you know, 36 point showing, not, yeah, I mean, pretty decent. Uh, but then up in North Bay, they just kind of um, absolutely demolished out there where they looked, they just looked like a seasoned veteran team um, with the 61 point performance. But, but for sure, you know, uh, there's been, I would, if you had said at the beginning of the year that within, you know, the top 15 teams, in the province, we would have seen two rookie teams, you know, and basically, you know, in the top 30, we've got another three here. So uh, that's pretty amazing. I, I, I don't think I would have guessed that at all. But I think the rookies have kind of been taking a lot of good, good advice from the veteran teams where, you know, I know for uh, those particular teams, they, they didn't overstretch themselves. Basically, I think we're looking at solid gear cyclers. Um, and whether they're, you know, simple passive gear cyclers or very simple active mechanisms, you know, single pneumatic piston um, plus a, a super reliable climb. Um, the, the rookies, which just kind of set the bar exactly there and executed that to the best of their abilities, you know, they, they really, really maximized that. I guess I'm this one over to Parth Patel, though. But uh, Parth, from your standpoint, any... Um, uh, what are your thoughts on the rankings? You know, uh, are the teams that you expected at the top? Uh, there's some that you don't didn't expect, and uh, and maybe in terms of teams that didn't make it, are there any some are there any major surprises there? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I think uh, uh, first of all, you know, the top sixty teams in Ontario, it's it's super competitive in Ontario as it is. So I I have I, there are definitely teams who I'm happy that made it, and there are definitely teams who I wish would have been on the list. So I just want to echo what's, uh, what Suthar said about, uh, you know, 1310 running meet robotics. I mean, they've been regional finalists a few times in the past. They've come close to winning some regionals. Uh, they've also won regionals. Um, and so they're a very competitive team, and, and to see them not make it, I think, was a bit shocking for me. Um, but one of the teams that I'm very happy that made it, and when I say made it, I mean they are literally on the edge, um, is 854. Um, I think they're 59th um, or 60th on the list. And they are a team that I personally love working with. Um, you know, their draft coach, I'm, I'm good friends with him, and um, they've got a good robot. They cycle gears pretty well. Uh, you know, we almost had an accidental four-rotor match with them at Ryerson. We didn't even realize how good we were at both at cycling until, you know, we saw after the match. Uh, so I'm glad that they're going to be at uh, at the provincial championships. Another thing that uh, another team that I'm slightly disappointed didn't make it is 4595. That's Team Infinity. Um, they're in the 70s currently in the rankings, but they were the partner that we uh, picked up at the Windsor event. And we, we've 610s heard a lot of praise about their performance at at Windsor. But if it wasn't for Team 4595 and 4917, we don't win that event. Um, you know, they did their job and they did it phenomenally well. They're an amazing drive team. They're a great group of people. Um, I'm super sad that they won't be competing at the provincial championship. Um, another thing that I find not interesting, but um, or, or I do find interesting, but not at all shocking, is that most, if not all, of the district chairman's award winners are in the top 60 um, by, by robot points alone, even if you take those 10 points away from the district chairman's award. Um, I think that says a lot about those teams and the character and the, and the program that they're building. And I think that's awesome. So congratulations to those teams. 
Yeah, and in fact, I'm, I can expand on that one even more if I have the time to actually pull up the FRC logs. But here are the district chairman's award winners highlighted in blue. There are a total of nine of them in Ontario. <clears throat> and I'll just count them off. Number one and number two, district chairman's award winners. <laughs> Number five, eight, nine, okay, so that's one, two, three, four, five of them, six, seven, eight, and nine. The ninth and the lowest point getting district chairman's award winner is team 1305, which still kicked butt with 88 points, ranking 25th. And so for any teams that were worried about, you know, maybe a, a team sneaking in a, a uh, sneaking through the back door into the district championships by winning a district chairman's, um, that is absolutely not the case because every single one of our district chairman's award winners would have qualified very, very comfortably on points and points alone. And so that's something that's really an interesting thing here up in Ontario. Uh, you know, correlation is not causation, but it just seems like if you're winning a district chairman's up here, you're also probably building a pretty darn good robot and uh, putting a pretty good product out on the field as well. Uh, and having said that, I, I think that's something that just, you know, we've seen over the past few years in Ontario where most of our district chairman's award winners are, are very, very well rounded, where they do have good robots in addition to being, you know, huge in the the outreach and all the other chairman's activities so very nice thing to point out there uh so no surprises from in, in that regard whatsoever where all of our chairman's award winners just happen to have been our top point getters um in terms of the teams that didn't make it there's probably just a few that you know i might throw out there uh and you know i'm going to basically start at 60 moving forward but um you know, uh, the Aztecs came back from Ottawa. They're actually a very seasoned team, but spent some time, you know, a away from the program. It was good to see them back, but traditionally they've been a pretty good robot <laughs> that I would have expected to see in the top 60. So kind of sad to see them not quite make the cut. Although I will say for a lot of these teams in the um, 62, 63, 64, you know, 65 area, uh, they probably still want to be keeping a close eye on their email inboxes. Because um, for every team that's unable to accept their invitation to the district championships, uh, another opportunity will be opened up. And so if you look at the rankings here, there has already been um, a team where it says DI, that means they declined their invitation and are not going to be able to make it. And so uh, you'll see that the number 61 ranked team has uh, subsequently been invited and has now been considered qualified. So. Uh, for the teams in this area, uh, you may just want to keep a close eye on your inboxes. But Lake Effect Robotics 2708, that's not a team number that too many people will recognize. But I believe Lake Effect from Kingston is um, a combination of two different teams. 2809, who um, has in the past you know, won Chairman's Awards, who has fielded some extremely competitive robots. Uh, as well as 3710, another team that has put together some very, very competitive robots. Uh, 2708, I believe, is a combination of those two particular teams. Uh, and in this particular case, it's, it's, uh, it's pretty surprising, despite the fact that you may not recognize their team number, uh, to not see them crack the top 60. But I've certainly got my fingers crossed for them um, in that hopefully their extended one. Uh, given that the district champs are also a occurring on Easter weekend, there might be a fair number of teams who for one reason or another are, uh, are unable to attend. So um, a few other ones, 4618, these guys had a, an incredibly strong showing uh, at McMaster just this past weekend. We'll talk about them actually a little bit more. Uh, and another one, 4914, uh, this is a team that had a, a, a very strong showing up in North Bay um, just this past weekend. Uh, they completely rebuilt their robot for that event. But the irony is, is that uh, that was their third event of the season. So points-wise, it didn't actually count towards their their points. And, and had it, they would have qualified quite comfortably. Um, but they're a very, very strong team. They're also the hosts of both the Fall Fiesta off-season event and also the Victoria Park district event that happened this year. And so um, kind of tough that they, they just missed out on district champs, but uh, they might just barely be in that stage where they too need to be looking closely at their at their emails. Um, I'll fire this one back to 
either of our panelists, Parth Patel or Parth Suthar, are there any other teams that you guys wanted to point out just before we move on? Last chance? I think we've covered all of them. All right. So moving uh, on. No one comes to mind. So moving on, we're uh, just going to take a look at the Blue Alliance and some insights in general about the two events that happened this past weekend. And so uh, I had a chance to be up in up at the North Bay event in person, and I know Parth Patel, you had a chance to watch some of the matches on the webcast as well. And I got to tell you guys, the North Bay, that, that group up there, they know how to throw an event. <laughs> um, I, I had a ton of fun at this event, uh, and in terms of super exciting really close matches uh these guys definitely took the cake as far as strategies were concerned this was a really nice one where we had um a bunch of teams which were converging on the three rotor three climb scores and the difference maker between them was was really the amount of fuel that an alliance could shoot so we basically had a whole bunch of alliances that could pretty easily hit that three rotor three climb. The four rotor really didn't happen a whole lot and I'll flip over to the insights just to kind of show that. Really we only had four of them during the qualifications uh, and it's really weird for me to say only four because in the earlier weeks four would have been you know massive. Uh, we only really had one in the elimination rounds uh, but we had a, a, a an okay amount of a fuel shot. Uh, you'll see that no one really hit the 40 kPa mark in the playoffs but the average win margin in the playoffs was down in the low 60s, which uh, on average is actually pretty tight. But if I flip back and look at the actual finals matches and just how much they were decided by, um, we basically had finals matches which were decided by you know only two points here in finals two. The deciding match is really only by about 15 points. And, and all throughout some of the semifinals, we had some tight matches here. Um, decided by one point in the case of semifinals, 1-1. One, one. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, and even in some of the quarters, we had some really tight matches all throughout. And so uh, a really, really entertaining match, or a really, really entertaining regional um, with some dark horses in there that I think teams really need to be keeping an eye out. Uh, and in one case, you know, 63-36, uh, Earning the, earning the top OPR um, for a rookie team at a tournament, which is a little bit crazy. And, and just going out there, um, just playing lights out, just delivering gears and, uh, and climbing. And, you know, this is kind of a, a bittersweet moment for 6336, uh, or a, a bittersweet mention, I should say, because they were up there with their mentor team, uh, 2013, and both of those teams are from the, the Barrie, Ontario area. And, um, you know, the 6036 had a phenomenal year. Uh, but I don't think I actually had a chance to talk about 2013, who unfortunately actually barely missed the cut as well for the district championships, uh, <clears throat> who, you know, improved immensely through the season and also had a pretty good showing up at North Bay, but unfortunately just barely missed the cut. Um, <clears throat> but uh, hopefully they can <laughs> at least live vicariously through <laughs> the Jabberwocky 63-36 uh, at championships, um, knowing that you know they were instrumental in the development of of that team up in that area, and so hopefully there's there's uh, a, still a nice story to be told based on that. Uh, but Parth Patel, any any <laughs> excuse me, any uh, observations from from North Bay that you might have uh, seen watching any of those matches? Yeah, so I, I, I mostly only got to watch the uh, semifinals. I happened to find myself at McMaster that weekend. But um, one of the things I want to bring up is you said that there were only four four-order matches at uh, the event at North Bay. Well, here's an interesting statistic for you. In three of those four-order matches, either 4476, the Waffles, or Team 865, Warp 7, were involved directly. And then they pair up together and end up losing and don't put up a single four-order match in the eliminations. I found that absolutely shocking to me. Um, both of those teams have cycled really well in uh, their other events. You know, 865 is a great shooting robot. They've 
you know, for, from a tiebreaker perspective, they can put a few shots in. So I found it very shocking that they didn't play, I think, to their fullest potential. But kudos to, you know, their opponents. And, you know, the Javilockies, you mentioned them. You know, they played against those guys really, really well. And those semifinals, like especially semis too, I was very, very amazed watching those because there was just a lot of good gameplay going on. And, you know, you shut down two teams that together, or had 75% of the four rotors in qualifications. Yeah, uh, you know, I, I think that was a master class in strategy on how to defend and how to go up against those four rotors. And so definitely, definitely the two most prolific gear cyclers, arguably, in Waffles and 865. And 865 could uh, had some shooting prowess behind them too. So it was a pretty formidable alliance, uh, despite the fact that they were coming out of the third seed position. Um, I think a lot of people looked at them and said, well, you know what? If there's an alliance that's going to beat the number one alliance, it, it might actually be the number three alliance. Uh, and in fact, you know, it ends up being the number <clears throat> two alliance that does it, um, which <laughs> came a little bit you know, um, out of the blue just because the Jabberwockies were rookies leading up that alliance. But very, very cool point of information for that one, Parth. Definitely, definitely agree. Definitely a very interesting one that, unfortunately, the job, the the waffles and and warp were not able to seal the deal, but um, but some pretty incredible matches nonetheless. Uh, but having said that, moving on from North Bay, we wanted to take some a look at the insights at, at McMaster, where with 42 teams, uh, that changes that alone is enough to change the complexion of this district event in um, almost entirely. Uh, this one being a little bit closer to the Greater Toronto Area, I think there were a lot of those Greater Toronto Area teams who looked at McMaster at being their second play. So there were a lot of points, district points, up for grabs. And so we expected this one to be really, really competitive with a lot of teams pushing hard just for that last opportunity to qualify for the district champs. Um, some of the more notable teams you're already seeing in the number one alliance, and even if you're looking at the top OPRs, you know, you had 2056 out there, you had 4039, you had 188. And of course, if you've been paying attention this year, you had also noticed 4976, because these guys have been uh, a lights out, both gear deliverer and a pretty prolific shooter, not necessarily a 40 KPA shooter, but, you know, in terms of support type shooting, these guys were, were, were pretty capable. We've got Celtex. Dennis Morris, 2852. Um, and as you work your way down the list, it's kind of a who's who of uh, a lot of who we've been talking about, including 854 down here. And so this was going to be uh, a very high scoring district event, and it certainly did not disappoint. Um, I think some of the notable ones were, you know, right off in the quarters matches, we saw the number one alliance immediately come out of the gate get both 40 KPA and four rotors and put up scores of 513 and 510. No penalties, just totally clean. And uh, that kind of set the stage for, you know, the rest of uh, the quarters where these guys would be a, a pretty fearsome alliance. But um, what was really interesting was that there were a lot of other alliances that were not to be trifled with. And uh, maybe I'll switch this one over to, to Parsuthar. Um, Parsuthar, do you want to tell us just a little bit about McMaster, what you saw there, anything notable that, that might have happened or kind of what the story was? So one thing I'd like to mention is that you, we were talking about North Bay where there were only about four or four, five in total four-order matches, where when you look at um, McMaster, uh, now in playoffs, you will see a four-order match in every single, in, in every single playoff match except for two. And that is saying a lot of it. Like that's just saying that the amount of uh, game, uh, amount of development this game has been through, and now how uh, every team is getting enough practice and sh uh, showing what they can do and what they build their robot to do. Um, because I've, there are only uh, three 40 KPA and four order matches, and they were all by. Uh, Alliance number one, which was 2056, 188, and 6725. Um, all I can say is District Champs is going to be really fun. <laughs> yeah, and, and that's a really good point because um, by saying, by pointing out the, 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 the number of four rotor matches, when you look at the statistics, you know, it says 
part of this is 100% correct where you know nearly every match in the in the elimination rounds had um, a four rotor you know done by one alliance or the other and you know I'm pretty sure in matches where one alliance got the four rotor and the other alliance didn't that was the deciding factor in the match and so we saw a lot of strategies which were not just revolving around who was going to get the four rotor but also preventing your opponent from getting the four rotor and so we'll talk about that in a lot more detail but uh, again for for this particular competition um the four rotor strategy really 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 drove the the playoffs uh, and in many ways it was a race to get to the fourth rotor and um if you won that race shutting down your opponents from getting that four, fourth rotor. And on top of that, for you know some alliances, in particular the number one alliance, they were supported by some pretty amazing shooters as well, who were able to get that 40 KPA in addition to that. Uh, Parth Patel, anything else to add sort of in general about the McMaster event? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, you know, just looking at the insights, like it, there are 18 qualification four rotor matches. And it's almost identical. Um, it's only off by one in playoffs. Like, that's ridiculous. There are so many 3RP matches. You know, the number of times the 40 KPA was achieved, that was 12 times, um, largely with uh, 2056 at play. But, um, you know, uh, like, even if you just look at the rankings, 2056 ranks first with 2.66. You know, 4907, uh, 1.83. Uh, these ranking scores uh, rely heavily on some of that 3RP that's coming into matches. And, you know, in fact, in qualifications, we actually even saw a 4RP match. So now if you take in just 42 teams in Ontario um, that signed up for an event sort of out of, you know, just kind of luck of the draw, now you go to top 60 in Ontario, you know, who are, in fact, the top 60 performing teams out there in Ontario, 4RP might be a very regular occurrence yeah. so now rankings becomes this whole puzzle right no, no one's going to figure out who's ranking where until the final match is played because every single match is going to flip the standings upside down well I, I think the only point that i might challenge you on is how common the four rp matches are going to be because i think it's still going to depend on having some super elite shooters of which i would still say in ontario where a little limited on. I mean, I, I think 2056 and 1114 are, are the two off the top of my head who can get close to achieving that 40 KPA solo in autonomous mode. They still need maybe a little bit help, uh, a little bit of help either by themselves in teleop or from some of their partners. But um, but it will be interesting to see the frequency of, in, in my opinion, three RP matches because uh, I think those four rotors are definitely going to be there way more often at district championships. Um, and there's going to be a lot more support shooters. So a team like 2056 and like 1114 should be hitting, you know, four RP matches, assuming they're winning them, <laughs> at, 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 a, at a pretty regular clip. So I wouldn't be surprised to see those two teams surface to the top, uh, assuming they have some pretty fair or even favorable schedules. But that's that's a really interesting one. <clears throat> so of course. I think it's about time that we talk about maybe the most interesting aspect of the McMaster event. And um, if I scroll down to the results, we just talked about the number one alliance knocking out these incredible scores during the quarters matches of 513 and 510. And you would assume, you know, with that kind of high powered offense that, <coughs> excuse me, I could safely scroll down here uh, and have them winning the tournament. But that number one alliance was indeed eliminated in the semifinals. Uh, they fell to the number four alliance, 40-39, 49-39, and 23-86. And um, this set of matches in the semifinals between the number one and the number four alliance was one that um, I know from my group of friends who were watching these eliminations unfold, we, we were kind of predicting that, I think one and four are gonna get together in the semis, and if anyone has a chance at knocking off the number one alliance, it might be the number four alliance. <coughs> Excuse me. And a lot of this came down to um, just sort of the, the two different strategies which were being run uh, at, by those two particular alliances, where the 4039 and 4939, 2386, number four alliance was starting to pump out 
some four rotor matches, which were very, very, very fast, uh, very, very fast or four rotor matches. And actually, panelists will probably jump in. They actually weren't the fastest one at this event, <coughs> but they were achieving four rotor matches, you know, with some regularity. Um, and how they could parlay that into beating, you know, another four rotor capable alliance that also had uh, an incredible shooter in 2056. Um, and obviously an incredible gear deliver in, in 188. And so what I'm going to do is you probably won't get a chance to see too much of this video, but um, we can kind of tell the story of semifinals 1-3 a little bit. And hopefully we can get at least a, a few screens on here. But... Um, <clears throat> As we tell the story between the number one and the number four alliance, um, we basically see 2056 getting out, jumping out to an early lead by hitting a good number of, uh, of fuel, earning 27 points. Uh, they both get a single rotor. They both get some mobility points. Uh, however, it was the blue alliance here, which raced out to another lead, and actually did the Blue Alliance, you'll have to refresh my memory, did the Blue Alliance actually achieve a two-rotor autonomous in this particular match? They didn't get the two-rotor autonomous bonus, but they just about had two rotors scored in autonomous. Uh, their third gear was, wasn't quite all the way up in the airship. Like they, had it, they had it lined up, it wasn't perfectly on, so they didn't get the bonus, but okay. essentially they had it delivered on time. All right, so they just missed it, but uh, Red does jump out to about a 30-point advantage due to the fuel that was scored after they even up their two rotors. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then the match kind of progresses with both teams cycling at this stage. Um, I believe 2056 does go and pick up some balls, though, and they choose to top up their 30 KPA and to try and finish it up oh, while they're delivering gears at the same time. And so if I kind of fast forward a little bit here, we're going to see the red alliance deliver gears and the blue alliance deliver gears. Uh, and it's hard to see who's got the, I'll pause it right here just to show a little bit of an advantage. But at this moment in time with 82 seconds left, we see the blue alliance, they've got a gear advantage where they've just activated their third rotor. So they're, they're up on gears by a little bit. And the red alliance is still um, kind of hanging on. 2056 is loading up on balls. It looks like they've got a full load. They're going to cycle a little more. And I'm, I'm trying to remember to the best of my abilities here. 2056 is now shooting those balls. I'm pretty sure they're going to try and top up to their 40 KPA here. Uh, but blue still has a gear advantage. And we'll just uh, kindly watch 2056. They hit their 40. They deliver a gear. And it looks like the blue alliance is short one gear, which is just delivered right then and there. And as soon as they activate it, I'm just going to pause. We'll take a look at where we stand now. And they crank that fourth rotor. Boom. That fourth rotor goes up. <clears throat> All right. So we've set the stage here. Red alliance has their 40 KPA, but they're down a rotor. Blue alliance has now just hit their fourth rotor. Um, we've created a pretty good points difference here and it looks like the red alliance has to finish that fourth rotor in order to catch back up and this is where things get very very interesting with 20 seconds remaining we're just going to pause right over here and if we look at the red alliance they have one gear that they need to basically win this match and they have actually two robots each with a gear in it. And this is where things get very, very interesting for those of you who are strategy aficionados and drive coach aficionados. The question becomes, what do you do? And so I'm going to let this match play out. And, uh, you know, you've actually got one more gear than you need sitting there. There's 18 seconds left. You've still got to climb. One of these robots has got to climb and one of them has got to deliver a gear. And as I play, we'll see 2056 loops around 
and they're going to present their gear first. And so they're going to try and score the gear. And unfortunately, I'll pause it right at the moment where catastrophe strikes, where 2056, unfortunately, is not able to successfully place the gear on the peg. At this freeze frame, the gear is actually on the floor. <clears throat> and at this point, 2056 will now try and climb. And off to the right, 188 has already started their climb. And it seems to be a very, very reasonable call. Most drive coaches probably would have done the same and said, I have two robots, each with a gear. The first robot that gets to that airship, they're going to go. They're going to try and put the gear on. And that'll be the one that we need in order to win the match. And then the other one, since we don't need that second gear, can just go ahead and climb. But because of that drop gear, <coughs> although everyone gets their climb up, the Red Alliance unfortunately was not able to finish their fourth rotor and subsequently ends up losing the match. And so really, really tricky one. Uh, not a super clear call in terms of what you should have done. And, and I think I probably would have done the same thing. But we have an opportunity to maybe look in hindsight and see if there might have been something that could have changed or could have been done to maybe change the outcome of that match strategically because um, that was a really, really tough one. Uh, I, I, I personally wouldn't say that the Red Alliance did anything wrong, uh, but after we peel back the layers, there might have been some alternatives that, that, that might have you know, prevented this. Hindsight's always 2020, but... Uh, I'll swing this one over to, to Parth Patel because I know you've looked at this match quite a bit and kind of looked at some of the different possibilities there. And so, Parth Patel, do you want to try and kick us off in terms of what your thoughts are on on the last few seconds of this match? Absolutely. I have so much to say about this final, like, 20-second period. Um, okay, first of all, you know, let's just look at the final score, 445 to 368. That is, in fact, uh, I believe, the final score that got posted on um, on FMS. I'm just going to double-check that on TBA. Um, it was, whoops, I have the wrong match here. There it is. Yep, 368 to uh, 445. So if you do some quick math, that is about a 77-point differential between, uh, or, or the winning margin was 77 points. So if you think about it, um, Getting that fourth rotor guarantees you the win because even if you don't have the 40 points for activating the fourth rotor, the 100 point bonus gives you the win on the red alliance. Um, so the four rotor is super important. Now let's go back a step and let's say you get the fourth rotor, which is worth 140 points effectively, 100 point bonus plus 40 points for activating the rotor. If they get the 140 point bonus, one of those robots doesn't need to climb because they actually double the blue alliance's winning margin. And so they actually still win the match. So now the question becomes, okay, well, if one of the robots doesn't need to climb, which robot scores the gear and which robot gets to climb? Because one of them still had to climb, right? And so you get into this weird scenario where now it becomes a drive coach's worst, worst nightmare, right? Because every drive coach wants to guarantee the hang because it's safety points. It's a safety net of 50 points. In this scenario, you know, one of you has to climb, the other one has to score a gear. I want to say, and, and, and for me this is easy to say because of the team I come from and what we've done at Windsor and how I've trained my driver on 610, but for me it's easy to say that 188 has to score that gear and 2056 has to climb, and 188 intentionally chooses not to climb in place of scoring the 140-point gear and getting the win. Now there's a few reasons why I say that. Sorry, I'm just, I know this is long, but I think 188 makes that call to score the gear and, and not climb because they have a floor intake, which means with 14 seconds remaining, they technically have enough time to try it once. If it misses, pick it up and try it again with a floor pickup. Whereas if 2056 were to miss, and, you know, they did, uh, they can't pick it back up. There's no second try. Whereas 188 guaranteed the hang but couldn't guarantee the gear. I think in the opposite where 2056, 56 guarantees the climb and 188 scores the gear, you have a better chance of trying it for the 140 points. 
Yeah, and there's um, a few, and there's a few other factors at play here because um, I think what you're saying makes a lot of sense. It's nearly impossible for a drive coach to assess all this, you know, in the last 14 seconds of the match with everything going and to make a call like that. But there are a few other things at play here where, you know, IC 2056, they're the first ones to the airship. So, you know, I, I just said that I probably agree with this call for 2056 to try and score this this gear and to go up, <clears throat> which they try and do. But the success rate here might be compromised a little bit just because 2056's rope is deployed. <clears throat> it's right in front of the robot. It's kind of in the way of the lift. And, um, you know, if you're really, really paying attention to the past history of this match, uh, 2056 had actually dropped a gear, trying to score almost in this exact identical position as well. <coughs> And so having said that, you know, maybe you do hedge your bets and you look at 188 and because you need that gear so badly, you know, you don't send 188 and say climb right away. Um, you say 188 actually don't, well, I, I think this is what you're saying, Paris Patel, is that you send 188, you actually say, you know, 188, you don't even care about the climb at this point because 2056 is still probably going to climb regardless of whether they score the gear or not, but 188, you put that gear on at all costs, no matter what, uh, and it doesn't even matter if you climb at that point because that gear alone is going to be enough to get the win. So that's a that's a really really interesting perspective, uh, Parth. And uh, well, the other thing I guess to factor in, and and again, you know, 14 seconds for a drive coach to go through all of this in their head. Being a drive coach myself, it's super hard to do. I'm only saying all of this because I watched it, you know, third person from outside but another thing to factor in is you know it scoring 13 gears still gets you 140 points but scoring 11 gears does not get you 140 points so you know it becomes a question of maybe both of you try to score the gear but you know 2056 if they miss they go for the climb whereas 188 if they miss they just pick it up and try again so you you know like maybe there's a bit of maybe a bit of let's try both and if they both go up great if not 2056 goes and hangs and and 2056 did miss the gear and hang successfully so that was still a valid possibility for 188 the question becomes you know try the gear at least before you go up yeah and um, and, and and that's kind of a on the surface that's kind of a crazy suggestion because there's two robots two gears in total you only need one so uh, in terms of an optimization problem, you would sit there and go, well, why would I attempt two gears if I only need one? But in this in this particular sense, or in this particular scenario, <coughs> excuse me, given that both robots have some pretty quick climbs, and again, you know, 188 just doesn't have to climb, and it has the ground intake, mm -hmm. um, you know, that's that's a, a pretty reasonable call. And, you know, hindsight is twenty twenty. I, I guess if we were in an exact situation like this again, it sounds like Barth Patel, you you would you would now make that call for 188 just to not even even necessarily think about hanging, just get that gear on there um, first and foremost, right? Absolutely, and you know it's something like with 610, I practice with my driver, and he hates me for it, but because he's a great driver, um, you know, I give him you know, 10 seconds to hang every match pretty much because I tell him, look, if you're ever thinking about the hang before the last gear, you're probably doing it wrong. We designed a robot to be a cycler. We've got to make sure we cycle gears. You've got to make sure you're the robot that puts the 140 point gear. Yeah. So for me, it's hands down, score the gear, then climb. Yeah, so I, that's a very interesting perspective coming from a team that is, you know, a super gear focused team. Literally, you actually practice very a similar scenario where, you know to sacrifice the hang for the gear, you know, in, in those situations. Um, uh, but yeah, this is, that's, that's a really, really interesting one. So, um, the, the, it, but it is kind of crazy to see that, that those last few seconds with a super high powered, uh, with a super high powered uh, alliance um, and full credit to the opponents that uh, they put the red alliance in this position by getting those four rotors, you know, early enough and fast enough that the Red Alliance was forced to make a decision like this. You, you shouldn't take anything away from that Blue Alliance from this win by any means, um, even if you consider you know, this loss to maybe have been a strategic quote-unquote mistake by the Red Alliance, which that's even hard to say because, like I said, you know, I, I would have done the exact same thing and maybe you know, 
that just means I would have made the same quote unquote mistake, but I, I, I'm so reluctant to even use that word uh, because I don't know too many other drive coaches who would have made that call. Maybe other than you, Parth Patel, if you were the coach of 188, just because you've basically been kind of practicing this exact same scenario with 610, knowing that you guys are so gear focused that you would have scrubbed, you know, your own attempt at a climb in a heartbeat. But that would have put a lot of trust in your partner to have executed that climb. Um, but you know what? Maybe you, you probably would have had that faith in 2056 to, to get that climb, even if they'd missed the gear, which they absolutely did. So that's, that's a really interesting perspective on that one. And I'm really glad you're able to share it. Uh, yeah, one of the things I want to add, sorry, just before we move on, like you said, you can't take anything away from the Blue Lions. Those two teams right there, 49-39 and 40-39, three district event wins. Chairman's Award for 40-39, EI for 40-39. They're absolutely amazing team. 23-86 was amazing. They deserved that win. Uh, they were absolutely phenomenal. 100%. Um, you know what, uh, Parth Suthar, I, I didn't want to pull you into this too, too much because you you are obviously from 188. I know this was, uh, <laughs> excuse me, it, it's, it, I mean, it was a challenging moment for your team to, to be eliminated from the tournament from it, but um, I guess I'll uh, feel free to decline and say no, but are, are, there, are there any comments or is there anything that you, you wanted to share from your perspective about this match? Uh, I don't really, I can't really say much because I wasn't behind the glass, but uh, from what I've heard, I think if I were there, I, I think I would give 2056 just the open side just because it's 2056 again. It's, it's one of the, t it was the team that was on Einstein finals last year. And it's the team that has been winning this many events. Is this, you you just look at the team number and you go like, okay, it's them. Uh, I would give them the uh, scoring advantage or just score the gear advantage. Um, but I, I, as part also mentioned that uh, going up or uh, climbing that early wouldn't make sense because we are, or sorry, 188 has the gear mechanism, or sorry, gear ground pickup. Uh, I, I don't know where I stand on this yet. Uh, I think I'll still go over this video a couple of times and then, I don't know, analyze it a bit more, I guess. Yeah, and, and that's a tough one because you know what? Probably nine times out of 10, 2056 puts that gear right onto that peg, no problem. You know, even even factoring in that fluke from, you know, or, or even the drop gear from a previous attempt in a similar situation, like the odds of it happening two times in, you know, a, a short span, probably pretty slim. Uh, but yeah, I mean, a lot of really interesting dynamics to, to the last few seconds of this match. And, you know, I, I, I hope it's at least one that, everyone else in the community can can spend some time thinking about because I, I'm going to say this, the teams which are going to the Ontario District Champs and, you know, especially those who qualify from there and go to the World Champs, uh, you're all capable of playing the game at this high of a level where there's a good chance you're going to be put into a situation, probably not exactly like this one, but, you know, similar dynamic where, you know, I, I hope your drive coaches can can maybe work out some of these scenarios and, and, you know, work out in advance what exactly you want to do in a situation like this, um, just so that our Ontario teams can <laughs> see more success than the other jurisdictions who maybe haven't quite analyzed the metagame quite quite to this level. So, you know, I, I, I don't want to speak badly of any of the teams who are involved in, in this particular match. Um, that was not any of our intentions and hopefully it didn't come off that way. Uh, but what I do hope is, is that this was an amazing like learning experience for everyone else to just hear everyone talk about it and what the different considerations were and what the alternatives might have been to, to maybe maximize the Red Alliance's outcome for this particular match, you know. So amazing. But thanks very much, all of you guys, for, for sharing your insights on this match. I know we spent a good amount of time on it, but hopefully that was worth the price of admission because I know this was, what, the, this was the match in particular that... Um, kind of made or broke the McMaster district for me because um, this was an unexpected result and you know I've, I've been wondering for the longest time if a pure four rotor alliance could beat you know this four rotor plus 40 kPA alliance uh, and even then that's one aspect that I didn't really touch upon which I will jump to now um, my apologies part we'll come back to to the to the four rotor autonomous topic in just a bit but how does a pure four-rotor alliance beat a four-rotor plus 40 kPa alliance? 
And kind of going back to this one, even in this match, there was a more interesting uh, decision, which I, I, I fought with just a little bit. And I'll, I'll go back to it kind of right here, where uh, the Red Alliance had achieved 30 KPA in autonomous. And <clears throat> it's basically at this point in time, I want to say a little around mid-match, where 2056 takes the time to do this, which is to increase, you know, their KPA advantage uh, and get that up to 40. And so time to taken to intake those balls, time taken to line up and to shoot those balls. Um, there's an opportunity cost, I believe, that 2056 took in order to increase this margin uh, to get that bonus where you know, you could make an argument that that time that they spent 40 seconds left, um, that was a margin that you could argue that they didn't need because they already had a 30 to 0 advantage on KPA, where if they had tied everything else, they, they would have won. Um, but the time spent there, they paid the price for at the end of the match because if they'd gotten those, you know, even few seconds left, um, 2056 would have been to the airship you know, a few seconds earlier uh, and would have been able to assess, yeah, we got that gear on or not, or maybe that rope is not in the way because a few seconds earlier it's not deployed. Um, and this was actually a question that came up during the last webinar where someone is trying to play this strategy, the four rotor and 40 KPA strategy, when do you shoot for those 40 KPA? Do you shoot for it beginning match, mid match, or at the end of the match after you have achieved your four rotors. And so, you know, I, I, again, this is an interesting match to, to, to ask the hypothetical. What if 2056 had saved those shots for the very, very end after they'd gotten the four rotors, um, meaning that they would not have been put into this position? Uh, and if they had scrubbed, you know, shooting those extra fuel to get to the 40 KPA, th that would have been fine because I still had plenty of a margin to, to get that win. And so that's another layer and another interesting decision where, you know, did is that an adjustment um, moving forward that we'll, we'll start to see and will this, will the result of this match maybe trigger it um, from, from our, our high-end shooters where they choose, when they choose to shoot for those 40 KPA. Uh, I'll send that one to, to both Parth Patel, Parsuthar. Any any comments on that one? Do you think that, that the, the shooting for the 40 KPA, the timing of that might change uh, from here on out? Um, I think it will change. And it, it is all because the 100 points bonus that the uh, gears do give you. Uh, if, once you have all four rotors running, uh, that you have enough time just to go there and start shooting balls because you are in that area and as you see right now like after 43 kpa uh scored uh if you see on the red line side or sorry red airship side there are so many balls just on the floor and being 2056 you have the pickup required for you to score that um other than that i mean if there's any other robot then uh if there's a robot that does not have the uh, ground pickup then i would say i mean uh, at that point, it depends. It now, now that's too much complication. Now. Uh, <laughs> other than that, I mean, if you have the pickup, go for it. Uh, score it at the end because there's no defense on you. There's no one going to come in and hit you while you're uh, aligned or anything. And that'd be all. Yeah, Pars Patel, any any thoughts on that one? If you, I know you, you know, I guess neither one eight or six ten have, I guess, elite level forty kPa shooters. But um, if you did, would you would you consider adjusting the timing of when you go for those forty kPa? I mean, having watched this match, I think it definitely makes sense to shoot at the end. But I want to play devil's advocate a little bit here, and you know, I mean, let's say you get thirty kPa, thirty five, thirty seven kPa in auto. I mean, teams have done it. You know, twenty fifty six had a qual match where they got forty in auto. Um, it's so high at that point that don't you want to just finish it off, get the 40 KPA, because that gives you enough point coverage to not, not have to hang. And then the argument, you know, it comes back to the, okay, now one robot doesn't have to hang, all they have to do is score that last gear. And, you know, the argument about last 30 seconds, there's no defense goes both ways. 
there's no defense when you shoot balls, but there's also, there's also no defense for you to score a cycle of a gear. So I, playing devil's advocate, I, I, I don't necessarily know if it always makes sense to shoot at the end, but let's say you only get 5 KPA in auto. I think absolutely shoot at the end. Get the rotors first because you're so far from, from getting that 40. But if you're 30 or above, it, maybe there's an argument, you know, get the 40 KPA, now you don't have to worry about hanging at the end. Now you just have to worry about cycling. One robot just cycle, 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 cycle. Yeah, that's a tough one because I would still say that the value of shooting versus the value of cycling gears is still going to be tipped in the balance of cycling gears because, you know, those 140 points are still far more valuable. But, I don't know, for a team like yours with 610 where you can actually shoot while scoring your gear cycles and not affecting your cycle time, that's kind of a no-brainer. Yeah, you're going to shoot. But if you're giving up time to to try and do it mid match. I'm I'm not sure I'm not sure if I'm totally convinced about that one quite just yet. But I guess we'll see. The, the time will tell and we'll we'll see how teams adjust moving forward. So but I think this is going to be a really interesting one to keep an eye on. Um all right. Well having said that, uh Parth Patel, I promised you that we get a chance to talk about two autonomous very quickly. We're going to run really close to time, but we will take some questions at the end. But for the two rotor autonomous, this is one where I think much to my surprise, and maybe not to Parth Patel's, this is starting to become a lot more popular. Uh, we're seeing it happen here, right here in Ontario, a little bit more often. It's still pretty rare, <clears throat> but um, the teams that have been doing it, I, I have to say, it's looked, um, it's looked fairly reasonably, or it's it's a fairly reasonable in terms of level of difficulty where. Um, for a team that chooses to focus on it and to do it, I, I, I think they can do it without, you know, going taking crazy efforts. But um, uh, Parth Patel, uh, tell us a little bit of what your thoughts are on the two-rotor autonomous and, and where you think teams are going to go with this. Well, first of all, I want to say I, I, I thought two-rotor autonomous was possible day one. Week one, I said it wasn't going to happen. Pilots are too slow. And then come Waterloo, I was the FTA at Waterloo, and you know what? I saw an alliance consistently put up two rotors, and I was like, wow, I was right day one. You know, it can happen. You just have to coordinate very well. And I just want to throw a huge shout-out to the finalist alliance at McMaster, and we didn't get a chance to talk about that much, but they actually hit two rotors in autonomous a couple of times. And, in fact, they actually won one of their matches. Uh, it was slightly due to penalty points, but if you look at finals two, um, they did hit two rotors in autonomous. Um, and they were the only alliance to do that. Um, so, you know, maybe if you think about a four-rotor alliance that doesn't do any KPA, that's another tiebreak for you, two-rotor autonomous. You know, another huge shout-out to Team 188. I know they didn't win the event, but they had a consistent two-gear autonomous, um, you know, that if they maybe sharpen up a couple of things in code, they might limit the number of robots that it takes to do two rotors to just two instead of three. So, you know, come, you know, district champs, it's another tie break that I think will happen more than we've seen so far. It's definitely not going to be an every match thing. It's definitely hard to do still, but it could make a huge difference in some alliances. Yeah. And, you know, maybe now we see a perfect score in Steamworks. 40 KPA, two rotor autonomous, four rotors, three hang. That would be amazing to watch. Yeah, I, I think the prospects of something like that happen are certainly possible at the Ontario District Champs. So um, that'll be that'll be really really interesting. Uh, Parsuthar, do you have any thoughts on on a uh, two rotor autonomous? Given that you're from 188 and you guys are capable of um, of doing that two gear autonomous, it sounds like you're sold on 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 trying to make that happen. I mean, yes, the, there's that's one of the reasons that we actually went forward and decided to do this is because it, there are not that many that many teams that have the ground intake and ground intake is just that much more um, valuable now because to do this you de you definitely need a ground intake and um, or at least that's the way we were looking at it we we're saying that um, if someone if we are paired up with someone who needs the time to shoot balls and uh, come uh, Hamilton event where McMaster where 2056 was shooting balls and to get most out of it you want them to shoot balls at all times instead of keep delivering the gear and then going to shoot balls which I I think they're capable of, of doing or they would be capable of doing but it, it just makes it that much easier when you have two robots delivering the gear instead of three and you're maximizing your score potential at that point. 
Very nice. Well, all right, gentlemen. Um, I'm going to go ahead and shift this one over to you, some questions from the audience. Unfortunately, um, our first senior mentor, Paul Keenan, is not able to, to join us this evening. But um, I'm going to see if I can go ahead and field some questions from the crowd. And so the first question that we have is from Quinn Monroe. And he asks, who do you think is the best rookie team in Ontario? And who do you think is going to win the Rookie All-Star Award at District Championships? Uh, that's going to be a hard for one for me to com comment on, uh, given the position that I'm in. But um, maybe I'll throw this one to, to Parth Patel very quickly. Parth, uh, have you got any leading candidates for the best rookie team? I mean, it's so competitive with the rookie teams this year. You know, uh, A-Team Robotics, Team Lynx, uh, the Disco Bots, I, and the list goes on and on and on, and it's phenomenal. I love it. Um, I'm going to go out on a limb and pick my favorite rookie team this year, and that's the Disco Bots Canada, 6387. Um, I'm not saying they will win. I would love to see them win. They're an amazing Vex team. They're a great group of guys. Um, you know, if you ever get a chance to talk to them, they're absolutely hilarious. They're fun-loving. They're awesome. Um, so my votes for them, I, I know there's no voting process, uh, but it's so competitive. It's literally anybody's game. Parsutar, have you got any leading candidates for best rookies out there and, and rookie all-star even? I would I would certainly say uh, Disco Bots and uh, Lynx, that is 63, uh, 6387 and 60, uh, sorry, yeah, Lynx Robotics and Disco, Disco Bots Canada. I've seen, I've, I've seen them at Woburn event for their VEX teams and knowing that they are the VEX world champions, uh, I put them above all because of their dominance in VEX and I know it's not the same uh, game, same event or even the same competition they do carry forth a lot of experience in there they're they're also doing amazing at all the events that i've seen them at um same with team links they're they're just there there's also there are so many rookie teams i mean i don't know how the judges are going to come up with one team in my opinion yeah, I think they're going to have a really difficult time because I, I never in my life have I seen such a strong crop of rookies emerge in just one season. Uh, I would love to be able to pinpoint what it was that caused this to happen and have us do, you know, 10 times more of it because it's it's pretty amazing. Because um, <clears throat> the hardest thing to do in all of first is to start a rookie team, in my opinion, and these teams have done a phenomenal job. And these look like they're going to be teams not just around for one year, but for the long run if, if, if things go well. And so, yeah, uh, thanks for your picks on that one. Sounds like there's... Sorry, I just want to do one more mention. Uh, they were impressive all the way back in week one and continue to be at Hamilton. Hayden Robotics, Team 60 23 You guys are awesome. Keep doing what you do. <laughs> awesome. Thanks a lot, Parth. Next question is from Charles Jew. Looking back at the past six weeks, there were a lot of field issues. Many replays were issued due to a broken peg, davit, or gear sensor. Will there be fixes to the field to make it more robust from first headquarters, or is this something that teams still have to deal with at district champs? Okay, so uh, I can answer that question in two parts. Uh, in our particular jurisdiction, the field which is going to the Ontario district champs is the same field which was in use uh, at McMaster, um, which you know uh, was a pretty good, pretty stable event. Um, there have been minor changes to the field in order to increase its robustness from week to week. So I'll give you some examples. When it comes to the springs, you know, um, after a few weeks early on in the season, they added uh, a little piece of electrical conduit that's inserted through the middle of the spring, which, which does make it a little bit more ro robust. It, it resists impacts and permanent deformation a little bit more. Um, <clears throat> The materials of um, the barbs were changed up earlier in the season as well to make sure that they didn't bend or break quite as easily. Uh, when it comes to the davit or the gear sensor, however, those ones are a little bit more difficult. Um, just being perfectly honest, I, I don't necessarily expect a change to happen either to the davit or the gear sensor or even for the pegs at, at this stage. Uh, if they are, they'd probably be relatively minor. Um, but even then, that's not something that we would necessarily know until uh, we, we go into the district championships, <coughs> excuse me, and, and first has issued a, 
a fix for them. Uh, but I wouldn't say it's outside the realm of possibility that something minor is done. But um, in terms of something major, like a, a complete redesign to a PEG, a DAVIT, or a gear sensor, uh, not, not likely, because that would open a whole other can of worms where if those things were to change, uh, we don't want to trigger any major design changes that will require the robots to change either. Uh, but having said that, um, I would like to say that um, the reliability of the field has, has generally improved over the weeks. Um, you'll notice that the McMaster and even the North Bay events were, were, were generally on time um, with, their, with their overall scheduling. Um, the communications issues have, have definitely waned um, from the earlier weeks quite a bit. Uh, we are seeing some wear and tear with, uh, with, with the fields a little bit, but nothing that we are overly concerned about, uh, especially now that you know, our FTAs have also gotten much better at, at, uh, at maintaining the field and, and keeping it alive from match to match. So we don't have any, any major concerns at this stage where we'll be seeing issues like we did from the earlier weeks. Our expectation is that the district champs should basically be as smooth as um, our latter week events, you know, looking at weeks five and week six, which, uh, which were much more smooth. Uh, the next one is from Alan Toms. He's got a whole series of questions here. First one is, when is the deadline for teams to confirm that they are attending the championships? Um, Alan, you're going to have to give me a second to actually look this one up because an email just recently went out to the teams. And um, hmm, I don't want to say until I've actually looked it up. So you're going to have to give me a few seconds here. Alan, <laughs> excuse me. <coughs> Um, it looks like that confirmation is required by Tuesday. Confirmation of attempt, sorry, confirmation of attendance or declining the intent to participate must be communicated to First Robotics Canada. Um, by today at noon, that appears to be the the email that I received here. Uh, actually, I'm going to have to triple check that one because that seems pretty early, but that might be the case. So, Alan, if you have not, here's what I'm going to say, Alan. If you have not confirmed, you need to email John Hobbins, John Hobbins at First Robotics Canada. Dot org. Uh, as soon as possible because uh, your deadline may have actually already passed and I believe there are two separate deadlines one where you just need to correspond and say that yes we intend on going so please keep our invitation live um, but there's a separate deadline for actual payment <clears throat> which appears to be a day later um, or at least guarantee of a payment um, but you do need to be <coughs> It, it looks like you need to have at least emailed John Hobbins now, if you haven't done so, to express your intention of, of competing or not. Uh, the next question from Alan Toms is, what is the process for rookie all-star winners that are not playing in the championships? When do we register for our interview? When are the interviews taking place? How many team members are part of the interview? And uh, I believe, Alan, you will be receiving a communication <clears throat> with these details Shortly, uh, from my understanding, is that the interview process, there will be a sign-up for it, uh, likely at the event when you first get there, <coughs> at Pitterman. Um And in terms of the number of team members, my apologies, I, I don't have that information for you at this time. Uh, nor do I have the schedule for the Dean's List interviews, which is your next question. So my apologies, Alan, I would have liked to given you that, that information concrete. Uh, but it looks like you're still waiting for that one um, to be finalized. The next question here is from Andrew Janes. And it is, what do you think about passive gear slots like Team 6009 who are going to district champs? How do you think they will do? All right, so passive gear trays, gear holders. <coughs> Advantages are that they're super simple, not likely to fail. Disadvantages are, are that they are hard to get the gear completely onto the peg and that they require the immediate attention of a pilot to be able to pull them up. Uh, this is going to be an interesting one. Uh, it's hard for me to comment on this, but maybe I'll rephrase that question to the other panelists, both Parth Patel and Parth Suthar. Um, do you think there's a place for the passive gear slots 
uh, for the passive gear holders, let's say in the elimination rounds for at the district championships, do you think one will be strong enough or some of them will be strong enough to be able to be picked? Or do you think the downsides of them are just a little bit too difficult to be overcome at this stage and that teams are basically scrambling to, to add some sort of active element to them just to give them that little extra edge? I'll, I'll fire this one over to Parsuthar first. Parth, uh, your thoughts on passive gear, on passive gear trays? Uh, all I can say right now is that if you already have a passive gear intake on your robot, then I mean you shouldn't waste your time going and uh, going on and adding the active intake because one you don't have you won't have enough practice with it because you won't, you don't have any on back time. Two, um, you will also need a lot. Uh, two will just make that much harder for your drivers, and now you will be uh, sorry. Number two would be that uh, you, you still have to put two robots in the human loading station to get the gears uh, out of there. So coordinating that would just be that much harder. And if you have uh, more than two robots, uh, sorry, more than two robots or three robots playing uh, in, t in gear, uh, having ground pickup playing in a match at district champs, chances are you will uh, the other team might be able to take your gears away from you because they have the gear intake as well. And um, from, I mean that uh, the other alliance might be able to take the gear intake, the gears away from you, as as you might have seen at other events. Yeah. Uh, Parth Patel, any any thoughts on passive gear slots, gear holders? Yeah, I mean, Suter outlined some of the uh, uh, some of the flaws. I'm going to outline some of the positive things. I think. The teams, you know, and you know, in the question they mentioned six thousand nine, so I'll use them. Uh, they were a very consistent scorer, and they could do a lot of cycles. And I mean, you know what? It doesn't matter what type of mechanism you have, passive or active. It matters how much practice you have at this point. Um, you know, at this point, everyone's played two, and in some cases, three events. Now it just comes down to how efficiently can you cycle. If you can make your passive mechanism not miss, who cares, right? I mean, um, not to harsh harp on 2056 but they have an active mechanism and they did drop a gear passive mechanisms have dropped gears you know 610 has an active mechanism we've dropped gears so is one better than the other i don't think so it's is one driven better than the other and that's the real question yeah i mean i mean it's kind of a broad statement because like you said i've seen passive gear uh i've seen pa passive gear mechanisms that are just better than active gear mechanisms and i've seen vice versa so if you've already got a pretty darn good one i i would probably just focus more so on on driving it strategy uh maximizing it you know just working on which peg you're going to select to go just the the tiny little details um yeah but that's kind of my style too i i'm i'm not one for making huge changes to your robot in between competitions especially with such a short turnaround uh with two district champs so i think they'll do fine i think if you're a good one you're gonna continue to be good uh i'm i'm not gonna be surprised to see you know uh, a few of them in in uh in the elimination rounds even at uh the ontario district champs no not, not maybe not like a huge number of them but if you're a good one and you've got a lights out climb uh, i think there's going to be a place for you so <clears throat> <clears throat> Next question is from Lori Bunch. Do I understand correctly that you said there is no defense for the last 30 seconds? Uh, we didn't say that, but I'm sure a lot of us hinted that playing defense around your opponent's airship in that last 30 seconds is probably not a good idea uh, when those climbing ropes are out. And so we hinted at the fact that you're probably not going to see a lot of defense in those last 30 seconds because the climb ropes are out and you're probably going to have free reign to be able to pick up fuel um, and score gears. But that's not to say someone who's super, super, super risky couldn't climb in there or fly in there and start bashing you around and playing defense uh, at the risk of, you know, giving you credit for a climb because if they touch the rope or if they touch you while you're touching the rope, uh, that's a very, very high risk endeavor. And so the short answer is, Laurie, no, we didn't say that there's no defense in the last 30 seconds, uh, but we did hint strongly that in those last 30 seconds, there probably is going to be <laughs> not very much defense. 
unless someone is willing to really play some high risk tactics in that area. Uh, Parth Patel, Parth Suthar, any more to add on that one? Just something real quick. You know, it's not just the penalties. I mean, they're a big deal, but um, everyone needs to climb. Like you've seen matches come down to four rotors versus four rotors, and if one of you doesn't climb, um, you know, finals are a great example of this at McMaster. The finalist alliance lost in the final match because two robots didn't hang. You know, um, so in the last thirty seconds, everyone's rushing to hang, and you want to give yourself as much time to do it so you can make sure you can pull it off. So there is much less defense just based on that. There's much less traffic. You know, even if one robot goes to hang right at 30, that's one less robot in your way to try and cycle. Yeah. So it's not no defense. It's more opportunity for you to cycle better. Yeah, I agree. All right, the next question we have is from Tiger Kong. And the question is, what do you think the power level of teams will be at District Champs compared to the various districts? <clears throat> ah, this one's a little bit tough. Okay, Tiger, I, I'm going to take the first cut at this one. Um, I think our robots up in Ontario are pretty phenomenal. We're obviously pretty biased. <coughs> Excuse me. I think the, 20, the 29 teams that will send on to the World Championships, all 29 of them are going to be difference makers. Uh, they're going to be sought after. I wouldn't mind, I, I wouldn't be surprised to see, you know, a, a very high number of them in the eliminations, you know, in each of their divisions if, if things go well. Uh, what's going to be interesting, though, is that that's not to say high score records are going to be broken at the Ontario District Championships, nor may we even see really super high scores. Uh, based on the strategic discussions that we've been having during this webinar, and the fact that I honestly feel that a higher percentage of Ontario teams, you know, engage in these types of discussions and are beginning to understand the metagame a lot more and, and trying to put it onto the field. Um, because of that, I think defense is going to be a large factor, a very large factor. Uh, it's going to get even more important as the matches go. Um, because of our willingness to play defense and the value that we put into it, uh, I don't think the scores in the Ontario District Championships and the statistics and the four rotor rates and maybe even the 40 KPA numbers, they're not going to look as impressive as, as many of the other districts. But in terms of the overall level of play strategically, um, I think we're going to be way up there. I, I mean, I want to say we're going to be the best in first, but, um, you know, that's a pretty, that's a pretty strong statement to make, but I, 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 I'm willing to say that we should be one of the top regions, um, with both with our robots and with our strategic play. And as a result of the strategic play, the statistics and the numbers and the flashiness of our, of our matches may not look so great. I mean, we just broke down a match, which, you know, that semifinals match where 2056 and 188 lost, you look at the score, it doesn't look very impressive at all. But within our community, that might have been one of the most interesting, most impressive matches that we've seen. Um, but it'll probably get no mention on Chief Delphi. At, at, well, maybe I won't say that, but it, I don't know. Uh, it probably won't because people on Chief Delphi only like to talk about the highest scores possible. Uh, Parsutar, any any comments on the relative power level of the Ontario teams and and our champs? I will say that I'll I'll be with you on this. I mean, I I want Ontario to be have to have the best uh, teams in first, but I have not seen any other district championships, so I I don't think I ha I will be unbiased about this. But I'll uh, I mean. My team's competing here. I want this to be the best event possible. Uh, Parth Patel, where, where do you think Ontario stands in the grand scheme of districts out there in terms of sc power, skill level, whatever, whatever you might want to consider that to be? I mean, uh, these are always hard questions to answer, and I think even the person who asked, you're aware, uh, you know, it's a hard comparison to make. But, you know, compared to some of the other districts, you know, we may not see the high caliber uh, finals that you saw at some of the other district championships because honestly in Ontario I think it's going to be quite the opposite where you're going to see a lot of the drama in the quarter and semifinals. Um, historically Ontario's been known to play more, more if not more effective defense at the very least than other events um, and I totally see that happening. I know there are lots of Ontario teams that are eager to try to shut down four rotors and win with you know three rotors and 40 kPA. So I, it could go anywhere. I, I, I see there being high scores in quals. I see there being low scores in quals. I see there being high scores in the limit. 
times, low scores, and low, like, it's going to be nothing short of entertaining. Yeah. Uh, and some of the best Steamworks gameplay. Yeah, I, I I'm gonna say it right now. I, I don't think any of the elimination in the elimination matches at Ontario District Champs, it's not gonna be an a straight up offensive free for all. Someone's gonna recognize that you know I'm the underdog in this match, or strategically, you know, one of the alliance. It's gonna make sense for them to try and play some defense or throw a monkey wrench into there to increase their odds of winning. Uh, I don't think we're gonna have any matches where they're just gonna go straight up uh, and shoot. Um, right to the bitter end, you know, that defense may not come until later on in the match, but there's going to be, we're, I think more so than any other district championship, it's going to be a, a little bit more of a grind, grinded out event. Um, so uh, take that for what it's worth. Uh, I, I think that's a very positive thing because I think that prepares you for the ultra high levels of play, which, um, you know, hopefully our guys will bring to the world championships um, and, and use it to their advantage and, you know, steal a few more wins for, for Ontario there. But, um, but yeah, we may not be the most talked about uh, district championship. Or, or maybe we will amongst the people who are really strategically um, inclined. But we'll see. We'll see. Because I don't think any of the Ontario... Well, I mean, the 513 match was pretty impressive um, out of... Uh, excuse me, out of McMaster. But, um, I mean, what's interesting is that they didn't end up winning the tournament either. So uh, that might just be a little bit of foreshadowing on the types of things to expect uh, in, in in our district championship and the types of things that our teams will try and do at the world championships if they're up against, you know, uh, another elite shooter from another region of which there, there are, you know, a number of them. Our guys will be prepared for that. Um, for the next question, uh, we've got a few more, and sorry to keep you guys on for this late, but it would be really nice to try and get through all of our questions because it seems to be a pretty popular webinar. Um, <clears throat> from Lori Bunch again, should there be a distinction between rookies Absolutely. who have never competed before and those who are a second bot for a school? <clears throat> uh, I'm not sure if... Uh, I'm really understanding what kind of a distinction we'd be talking about. Should there be a distinction between rookies who have never competed before and those who are a second bot for a school? Um, I actually I think... Is there... my... Sorry, go ahead, Parth. Sorry, I was just, I was just going to say I think this might be alluding to you know a new-to-robotics competition team. Uh, and, and sorry to put words in your mouth, Laurie, but I think it might be, you know, a team that's competed, say, in VEX or a team that's competed in um, in FRC through a, a sister school or something like that, but now have their own team uh, versus, you know, brand new, new to the curb team. I think that might be what the question is asking. Yeah, or and, the other part could be, you know, for a team that spawns a second team, like a 1241 and a 1285, um, if you carry over enough shared mentorship, um, I, I can tell you that there is... The, the that sister team, 1285, is, was not considered a rookie in their first year. So that one I can answer pretty quickly and pretty clear cut that, um, yeah, in a situation like that, that second team is not going to be considered a rookie. Um, <clears throat> and so, but yeah, for, but for parts, 30. yeah, 33, 30, 30, 13, 34, uh, they spun off a team 30, from, uh, Sorry, 1374, both from the same school. 1374. 1374 is not considered a rookie, uh, their first year in operation either. So, um, yeah, in that case, there there is a distinction in that case. So uh, hopefully that answers your question on that one. Uh, and usually you can look at the team numbers because you'll see that they're both low number teams that were spawned as second bots for those schools, um, and they would not have been considered rookies. The next question we have is from Andrew Champ. How do you think the practice fields will be at District Champs? Unfortunately, that's not one that I can answer. Your best bet is probably to, to send an email to um, the director of FRC, John Hobbins, who is um, who's heading up that event. So he should be able to get you an answer. Uh, Look at his split, hopefully. And unfortunately, I would tell you the answer if I, if I had that information with me. But at that time, unfortunately, Andrew, uh, I wish I could give it to you, but, but I can't. Uh, Lori Bunch, the practice fields were not the same as the actual fields and lengths and angles. Is that to be expected at the larger events? We noticed this with the autonomous. Also, why are we not allowed to use a measuring device on the actual field? Okay, so the first question is the practice fields <coughs> uh, being the wooden mock-ups. There, there is a tolerance between those 
and what the actual field elements are going to be. And so um, I would agree that they could be off by, um, I, I, I would normally call it a small tolerance, but having been on the team side, sometimes that small tolerance is big enough to make a, a difference in terms of you know, your shots and angles and things like that. So is that to be expected at the larger events? Uh, uh, generally, yes. The world, <coughs> excuse me, the world championships are an interesting exception because their practice fields uh, are often full fields in, in some cases where it will be very, very similar. But I will even say this. There are some differences from field to field, even with the full official main field that you compete on where um, there could be some differences where there's kind of no replacement for taking your measurements on the actual field. Which leads to your second question, which is also, why are we not allowed to use a measuring device on the actual field? You are actually allowed to use a measuring device on the actual field uh, during the times which are set aside for measuring the field. What you are not allowed to do, though, is to bring it onto the field uh, as you are setting up for a match. And so you can't bring on a measuring device which is separate from your robot. So this is where things get a little interesting and maybe uh, probably both Parth Patel and Parth Sutar can comment on this one. But um, if you had a, a measuring device that was actually part of your robot, uh, it, it gets into a weird technicality here where you, you could use it um, as long as it stays on the field and it is part of your robot and it abides by all the other rules of being a part of your robot. Um, I'm pretty sure I've got that one correct, but uh, maybe I'll just double check with Parth Patel. Parth, are there, are there any concerns with, uh, I guess, what I've just said there, seeing that you are an FTA and I think you've run into this situation before? Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. It cannot be something that you bring in. You can't bring a measuring tape in your pocket and use it to measure. But if it's something that, like, you can attach a measuring tape to the side of your, fr <laughs> your robot and you can use it to measure. And that is perfectly within the rules. Yeah. In fact, when I was on 188 as a student in, 20, uh, in 2012, we had lasers on a robot, and we used those to line up the robot because the lasers would be on the perfect part of the backboard. And when we saw the reflection, we said, okay, there you go. It's lined up. Yeah, and, and those lasers were permanently attached to the robot. And I even remember in 2006 when I was a mentor on 188, uh, I had a little tube that I would use to look through to try and line it up to the robot. And it was actually separate at first where I kind of held it to the side of the robot to align it to the goal. <laughs> and then I pulled the tube off. I slipped it into my pocket. And then a ref called me on it and said, uh, you're not allowed to have a separate measuring device. And then so I proceeded to zip tie the tube to the robot right then and there. And then the, the ref gave me a thumbs up and we were good to go. So uh, interesting kind of collection of rules surrounding that. But, um, but the, the short answer is that you are technically allowed to use a measuring device depending whether it's part of the robot or not or whether you are measuring during the actual time set aside for measuring the field, which you're allowed to bring uh, separate measuring devices up uh, to your heart's content. Sorry, I just want to also reiterate something for rookie teams and other teams who may not know. The measurement time uh, Mr. Lim or, or Sean is referring to is um, the actual real field where matches will be played that count has usually a half an hour set aside, uh, usually on day zero or practice day, where you can bring your robot onto the field, you're allowed to tether to it, you can do camera calibrations, sensor calibrations, measurements, anything that you need to do to make sure your autonomous mode works. Yep. And that's all within the rules. So take advantage of that time when you have it. 100%. Uh, last, or sorry, uh, next question is, and we're running to the end of our questions, also from Lori, does FRC discern between rookie teams that never existed, those with the second bot, or those who have folded and reopened as a rookie bot? Uh, yes, they do. And so um, rookie teams that never existed are going to be rookies because they're pure rookies, I guess is what I'd like to call them. Um, those with a second bot, the instantiation of a team with a second bot generally is not considered a rookie team just because it's from the same school and they've got common mentorship. And then those who have folded and reopened as a rookie bot, for a team that has folded and reopened, uh, there are a few stipulations there where... Um, if a certain amount of time has passed, and um, I believe it's also if there's not a whole lot of, well, I think it's primarily, if it's, I, I don't have this stuff right in front of me, but um, at a certain point, a team in that situation actually has the option of deciding to return as a, as a veteran team, 
under a number, the same number that they folded in the past, <coughs> excuse me, or another one comparably numbered in around the same range, and they'll be treated as veterans. Or if you do reopen as a rookie, then your number will be issued as a rookie number. So the short answer is, is that you'll always be able to tell by looking at their number. If they uh, if they reestablish them if they reestablish themselves as rookies this year they'll have a very high six thousand number, um, but if they reestablish themselves as sort of reviving uh, an original team or an old team, their number will be very very low. But you'll be able to tell based on the number of the team that that basically will tell you definitively whether they should be considered rookies or not. Uh, last one, last question. Uh, I don't even really want to ask this one, but we've already taken enough time. Charles Jew asks, which team in uh, the Ontario District has the best cheer? I'm sorry, but I've got to go with 7-7 seven, seven who and 7-7-2. Seven, seven, uh, I'll leave this one to the two panelists. Parsuthar, do you have an opinion on this one? I would also <laughs> like to say 4039. Because I was not at 7-7-2's seven, seven, event, uh, I, was, I, was, I was at 4039's events, so there's that. All right. Thanks very much, Ann. Um, I'm just going to chime in here. Yeah, I I got to go with 772, 772. I mean, I, I've been competing in FRC so long, and every time someone says 772, I have to say 772. I have to complete the cheer. It is too catchy. It's awesome. All right. Well, thanks very much, everyone, for uh, joining us this uh, this evening. And I just wanted to let you guys know that next week we've got another very interesting webinar where we'll be able to recap the district championships, which I know is going to be uh, basically a fire show just because of the quality of the robots that are out there uh, and even just knowing that they, they're going to be churning through a lot of the strategic developments over the past few weeks and we're going to see some high level of play. And we'll also get to preview the world championships and maybe get a breakdown of who are 29 teams out of Ontario uh, and who they're going to be to represent our province there. Uh, that's going to be a really interesting discussion because, you know, <clears throat> the district model, this has been one of the things I've been most excited for is just to see if we sent our absolute best teams and robots to the world championships, what exactly are, what, what exactly would they do um, in that field? And uh, uh, I'm, I'm really curious to, to maybe predict, you know, what the outcomes might be for some of our top teams out there. Uh, but either way, thank you to both Parth Patel from Team 610 and Parth Suthar from Team 188 for joining us this evening. We really appreciated having you guys on. A little bit of a long webinar, but a lot of content, a lot of really interesting things to discuss, and we really appreciate it. Have yourselves a great one, guys, and uh, we will see you next Monday. <laughs>